uh, Chapel Hill, Carolina fans, Tar Hill fans in here? Anybody? Okay, okay, Duke fans. Duke fans, a couple of proud Duke fans, great. Uh, Wolfpack fans? Wolfpack fans? Yeah, yeah, that's my people. That's my people. Uh, East Carolina fans. Y'all, y'all can repent after the service, after y'all hurt my poor Wolfpack last week. That'll be okay. That'll be okay. Hey, um, if this is your first time, and I realize that's like all of you, really, thank you for being here. Um, but I especially want to say a big thank you if you're here, and maybe you're not from a church background, like it's your first time in church in a long time, or maybe your first time ever in church. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, if you're here and you're not really sure what you believe about the whole Jesus or God thing, man, we're glad you're here. It's going to be a great morning. If you have a Bible or if you have a Bible app on your smartphone, I would recommend you version. You can get it and you can go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll be hanging out. It is towards the back of your Bible, hanging out with Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and all those sorts of guys. And if you don't have a Bible, because you don't own a Bible, uh, man, drop by guest services or next steps on your way out, and they will give you a Bible. You can take it home, and you can read it. Um, so let me set it up like this, ask you guys a question. How many of you have ever had great plans for a day, and then something happened to throw a monkey wrench in your plans, and it ruined your day? Show of hands. Show of, okay, some of you aren't playing along. You're being big chief, no fun, okay? We can, be, we can have fun in church, okay? So um, about five years ago, my wife and I had just gotten engaged. We got engaged on Memorial Day weekend, and then like two days later, she went off to South Carolina to be a summer missionary that summer. And so I got to visit her twice that summer. And one particular weekend, we had like a Sunday afternoon that we had planned, and it was going to be awesome. Uh, we were going to go to the beach, all that sort of stuff. So I got up. I went and picked her up. We went to church. It was kind of an interesting experience. Some of you may have had that interesting church experience that was a little like, eh. Maybe you might think that's what this is, but that, that's okay. Judgment-free zone. Um, and I'm kind of odd anyway, so I just accept it and roll with it. Um, so, so we do that. We went to Wild Wing Cafe. By the way, who loves for, uh, uh, Wild Wings? Who, lo- who loves, uh, let me think, chicken wings. Chicken wings. Who loves chicken wings? Yes, praise God. So if at any point the Holy Spirit begins to move in your heart and tell you to take me to Buffalo Wild Wings for lunch, you probably just shouldn't fight that. You should probably just do it. It'll be great. Um, that's a joke. Uh, but seriously. And so we went to Wild Wing Cafe. It was great. We had chicken wings. And we get back to the car, which was my parents' car. I was borrowing it at the time. And I put my key in the ignition, and I turned the key. And all I heard was click, 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 click. Which all of you know, that means what has happened to the car. Dead battery. That's exactly right. Now, I'm about four hours from home at this point, and I had a great afternoon plan. And so the first thing that happens is always denial. It's like, no, this can't be happening. I'm far from home. This is not the way I planned this day out. And then sadness sets in, and then resignation. And then because I didn't have jumper cables in the vehicle at the time, I went and had to find jumper cables, which some of you, y'all don't have jumper cables in your car, and you should go out and buy some so that when your battery eventually dies, when it is pouring down rain, you will have a way to restart your car. That was worth the price of admission for a lot of you. You're welcome. And so we go around Walmart. We're looking for jumper ca- someone with jumper cables. We find somebody, and they jump the car. At this point, in my genius mind, genius might be a stretch, but I consider, huh, I might want to go get a new battery so I don't end up on the side of the road on the way back home. And so we uh, go around. We're like, well, how hard can it be? There is surely on Sunday afternoon an auto part, uh, an auto place that is open. Wrong. There was not anywhere. And this was back before I had a smartphone. So we're on like the old school GPS trying to find places, and we can find nothing. Eventually, we found a Walmart. And I was like, well, maybe Walmart has something. And they did, and they're like, if you'll just sit outside for 30 minutes, we'll get to you. Because everything happens slow at Walmart, right? I don't know of anybody who's ever had a quick trip at Walmart. Even if you need one item, the wait in line, even if it's the self-checkout thing, is like 30 minutes. It's terrible. Um, and so we get to Walmart. We go. We get a battery. We get it in the car. And by this time, it's basically time for me to leave. And I remember my wife, or future wife at the time, saying, it was not supposed to turn out this way. And I remember saying, I know, like we had better plans. So here's the idea that comes from that that will lead into where we're going this morning. Something dead kept me from doing something good. And that's my car battery story. But for some, or maybe even many of you in this room today, that's, that describes where you are in life right now. And here's how that works out. Every single one of us, from the time we are born, we are hardwired with a desire to do something significant in our lives. We're hardwired to be 
difference makers. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, on my tombstone, when I die, because all of us will die, I wanted to say they were average, ordinary, mediocre, and they just blew it in life. They never did anything significant. None of us want that to be the case. We all want to be difference makers, which is one reason why I believe that regardless of who you are and regardless of what your background is, anybody can connect here at LifeSpring because the thing we're all about is making a lasting difference in the lives of people in Smithfield and beyond. We want to be a church that doesn't just do church. We want to be a church that makes a difference. And so I believe you might hear that and you're like, that sounds great. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a difference maker. But for some of you, there's literally one person standing in the way of you being a difference maker, and that is you. And here's why. This will be on the screen. You can write this down. As long as I'm dead, I can't make a difference. As long as I'm dead, I can't make a difference. Now, you may say, okay, I came to check this new church out. Um, I thought it would be weird, and now you've proven it um, because, because you just said I'm dead. Like, I feel pretty alive. I'm alive and kicking. kicking. Um, what other weird things do y'all do? We'll break out the snakes next week. You can come back for that. <laughs> no, j kidding. That's a joke. I, I hate snakes, and if you have a pet snake, your pet snake sucks, and I will kill it. Okay? Do not bring your pet snake anywhere near me. I hate snakes. And so, so but you might be thinking, um, I'm alive. I'm breathing oxygen. I'm walking walking around. I don't understand this idea of being, of being dead. Well, you're not dead physically. I would actually agree that you are physically alive, but here's the question I would ask. Have you ever paused to consider whether or not you are alive spiritually? See, because just like a, dead, a physically dead person can't make a difference, neither can you make a difference if you are spiritually dead. You might say, well, what, what makes you spiritually dead? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, a guy named Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus about 2,000 years ago, and he says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So if you're not from a church background, you'll hear that and you'll say, I don't understand those two words. Here's what those two words mean. Um, they have very, very similar meanings, but transgressions and sins both carry this idea that all of us do things that God says are wrong, transgressions and, or sins. But sin also carries this idea that we don't just do things that God says are wrong. Hardwired into our DNA from birth, we have a natural tendency, we are prone to to do things without even trying that disobey God. And Paul says that those things, while they ultimately they do lead to physical death, but in the immediate, they make you spiritually dead. And as long as you are dead spiritually, you can't make a difference. Now, that begs the question, how can I tell if I'm spiritually dead? Because not everybody in this room is spiritually dead. So here's a good, uh, good test. Verse 2 says this. These are ways in which you used to live, when you follow the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So if you want to identify whether or not you are spiritually dead, don't look at whether or not you've been in church your whole life. Don't, whether, don't look at whether or not your mommy and daddy were a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. Don't look at whether or not you try to do some good things. You need to look at this one thing. Do you follow the ways of the world? What are the ways of the world? The ways of the world are basically everything that God says, is wrong. And what makes that uncomfortable is many times that's the things that culture will say are okay or they're really not that big a deal. There's the ways of the world. There are even small things that we excuse, things like gossip, things like a little white lie, like lying on your taxes, hello, okay? There are things like holding a grudge, not forgiving people. See, sometimes, especially in maybe the ministry tradition I come from, if you don't have sex outside of marriage, and if you don't get drunk, and if you're not gay, then you're pretty good. No, 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 that is, that is, that is not the case. If you do any small little thing that God says is wrong, then you are spiritually dead. And here's what makes that really, really bad news. If you do those things, if your life is marked by doing things that God says are wrong, then you are following Satan. The ruler of the kingdom of the air that Paul identifies in this passage, that's another term for Satan. Now, I, I think if the, you're here this morning, you would say, that is unsettling. And I would agree. I don't think anybody wants to follow Satan. But here's the deal. There are two sides of this thing. You are either following Jesus or you are following Satan, and there is no middle ground. There's no middle ground. It's either Jesus or it's Satan. But, but here, and here's what makes this even more complicated for us. Since we are born spiritually dead, our default position is spiritual death. 
And we naturally do things that lead to spiritual death. It's like, I don't like that. I don't either. But you know what makes it hard? It's what we naturally like to do. Verse 3 says this. He says, all of us, by the way, sin is something that affects every single one of us. Every single one of us. All of us, regardless of your background, we are all born spiritually dead. We are all born separated from God. So he says, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. In other words, the very things that lead to death for us, they're things we like to do. For instance, if you don't believe me, how many of you like to eat? Show of hands. Okay, even the vegans in the room like to eat because you get jealous when we eat steak, okay, right? So, but all of us, we like to eat. I love to eat. If you hear me, if you're around me much, I will talk about food. I was one time accused of using food as a sermon illustration all the time. It's because it is constantly on my mind. In fact, this evening, because it is my birth month, I do not have a birthday or a birth week. I have a birth month. I celebrate it the entire month and indulge in all sorts of succulent, sweet, tasty treats. And so tonight, I'm going to Cheesecake Factory and paying for an overpriced piece of cheesecake and it will be amazing because I love to eat but here's the thing here's the thing if I constantly and blindly follow my desire to eat where does that put me on a <laughs> diabetes on a gurney with a heart attack <laughs> or with diabetes as whatever the dude's name was that I saw on Cartoon Network as a kid yeah it ends up being bad for you it ends up being bad for you. You cannot just blindly follow your natural desires because they lead to death. And, well, and, and here's what, but here's what makes that like even more tense. It's like, I don't like that. I don't want to do those things. But here's the thing. It's fun. And maybe you've never heard a pastor say this, but I'll say it. Sin is fun. And if you're like, I don't agree with that, it's because you didn't sin the right way. Sin is fun, at least for a little while. Just like eating cheesecake day after day would be fun. But eventually you end up with bad heart problems. You end up dead. And so we may not want to do those things, but they're actually fun. And so we follow them, but eventually it leads to death. Teenagers, uh, middle school, high school students, this is one reason why when somebody tells you to follow your heart, that's like the worst piece of advice you can be given. Because the desire of your heart is to do things that lead to death. And by the way, your heart doesn't even know what it wants. You like this guy or girl last week, and now this week you like another one. Like your heart is confused. Do not follow your heart. But we have a natural tendency to follow those things because it's the way we are. We are born spiritually dead. We have a tendency to do the things that lead to spiritual death, and they're fun. So it makes it even harder to say no to them. But here's the really, really bad news about all that. The last part of verse 3 says this. Like the rest, we were by nature, our default position, deserving of wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath. God's wrath against sin. By nature, we're objects of judgment from God. And see, I, I, know, I, know, where that's, I know where that's the walls, get, that's where walls go up. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't like that idea. Like, I don't like the idea of a loving God that I would judge people or that send people to hell. Well, let, let me explain how this works out. God is perfect and God is sinless. Another word for that is holy. He is without sin. He is life and he is the source of all life. And because he is alive and he defines life, he will not let anything into his presence that brings death. So therefore, he will not let anything into his presence that is dead. Even the smallest amount of death, he will not lead, let into his presence because death brings separation from that which is living. In fact, uh, my wife and I learned this in a very, very painful way this week, so if I get emotional, don't judge me. Um, but we had a dog. Her name was Sophie. Awesome, cute little thing. Uh, but on Monday afternoon, we found her in our backyard, dead. And I, I know some of you are like, all oh, the other of y'all are like, it's just a dog. And you probably like cats, okay? Um, and I just want to let you know, if your cat was bigger than you, it would eat you. They, yeah, exactly. If your dog was bigger than you, it would just cuddle with you more. But your cat is looking at you thinking, if I was just big enough. I would eat you and go find catnip. Like, that's what your cat is thinking. And so, um, but, but our, our, our little dog, Sophie, died with a really, really awful accident. Um, but, but here's what hit me in, in that moment. I can't play with her anymore. I can't run with her anymore. I can't cuddle with her anymore. Why? Because death has brought separation from that which is dead 
and that which is living. And the same thing is true spiritually. When we are spiritually dead, we are separated completely from that which is living. And we have no chance to get back to that which is living. Because here's the other thing I learned in that horrible moment on Monday. No matter how much I want my, want my little dog back, because she is dead, she can't make herself come back alive. She can't do anything to make herself live again because she is dead. Therefore, she cannot reunite herself with me in the exact same way. When we are spiritually dead, there is not a single thing we can do to unite ourselves back to God because we are dead and therefore we are incapable of making ourselves alive. And the really, really bad news about it is about that is Scripture says the penalty for sin, which we all sin, is both death, physical death and spiritual death, and eternity separated from God in hell. And see, that's the, that's the part where a lot of you are like, I, I don't buy that. Like, I, I, I like that. See, Dylan, this is why I don't do the Jesus thing, because I can't buy the idea of a loving God sending people to hell. Well, well think about it this way. Um, how many of y'all are familiar with the name Brock Turner? Show of hands. Show of hands. Okay, most of you not. I'll introduce you to Brock Turner. He was a student at Stanford University, um, and some time ago, uh, he sexually assaulted a female who was unconscious. Now, how many of us would agree that is deplorable and that is awful? Show of hands. All of us, right? Like, to be quite honest, I think think the punishment for that should be render be making the dude incapable of performing that sort of thing again. That's my opinion. But we look at that and we're like, that's awful and that deserves punishment. But here's what makes it worse. The judge gave him a grand total of six months in prison. Like, and we look at that and we're like, that's not right. That's not right. Somebody could rape somebody and get six months. Like, like maybe six decades would be fair, but six months, that's not right. That's not just. The judge must be corrupt. See, we expect imperfect, fallen, messed up humans to be just, and yet somehow, given the fact that literally every single sin is a spiritual equivalent of spitting in God's face and flipping in the middle finger, we somehow think we should be able to do those things and then say, hey, God, let me off the hook doesn't work that way. See, because God is perfect and therefore he is perfectly just. And if he is perfectly just, he must perfectly punish sin 100 times out of 100 or he ceases to be the perfect just God that we think he should be. See, oftentimes we want God to be just when it comes to others who have screwed us over, but we don't want God to be just when it comes to dealing with our own sin and our own imperfections. That's why... It's actually completely right and completely fair and just of God to judge us for sin because we are spiritually dead, we do the things that make us spiritually dead, and therefore since we are dead, we can't make a difference. If you ever want to connect with your purpose, this has to happen. I must be made different to make a difference. I must be made different to make a difference. <clears throat> a lot of times we, we hear this about sin. And my guess would be this is not the first time some of you have heard this. But many times our reaction will be, okay, that's bad. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try to do more good things. Maybe I'll even go to church. Maybe I'll read my Bible. Maybe I'll start praying. Maybe I'll try to do some more stuff. But here's the thing. As long as all you do is put religion on it, and as long as all you do is just try to make yourself better, it's like putting a band-aid on something that requires stitches. It won't work. It won't work. You cannot make yourself come alive. But see, here's where the good news about Jesus gets so good. Because we are hopeless. We are helpless. We are spiritually dead. And yet we see this reality in verse 4. It says, but, by the way, God has some big butts and he does not lie. That, that, that is funny. If you are not laughing at we can have fun in church. That is funny. Okay? It says, but because, watch this, because of his great love, for us, God who is rich in mercy. See, we talked about this God who he will judge sin. He perfectly judges sin. He punishes sin. And, and we look at that and we're like, I don't like that. But see, if that's all you understand about God, that is only half the picture. Because God is not an angry old man sitting in heaven waiting for you to screw up and then smacking you on the head when you do that. He is a perfect, loving, heavenly Father who, yes, He will perfectly punish sin, but at the same time, 
He loves us. He has mercy. He actually made a way for us to escape the punishment for spiritual death, even though we did nothing to deserve that. How did he do this? Verse 5, it says, He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God made us alive by expressing kindness to us in Christ. How did he express kindness to us? This is how he did it. He knew we were hopeless. He sent his son Jesus Christ to earth to live the perfect sinless life that none of us could ever live and then go to a cross and die so that he can nail our sins and every single wrong thing we've done to the cross with him, take those things to the grave, and then three days later, because in order for us to come alive, we need somebody who is greater than death to bring us to life. So three days later, Jesus did not stay dead. He got up from the grave. He rose again so that if we put our trust in him, if we give him control of our life, if we follow him, he makes us spiritually alive. And not just spiritually alive in the sense that we don't have to go to hell, but he gives us hope, he gives us purpose, he gives us joy, he gives us peace, and he begins to change us to work in us and to work through us to advance his mission in the world of seeing people meet Christ and having their lives change. And that's the way that communities, states, and nations change. It's not by policy and programs and processes. It is by people meeting Jesus and having him change their lives. That's why we say all the time around LifeSpring that our mission is to reach people far from God. Because we know the only hope for people is a relationship with Christ. And then we want to teach them how to follow Jesus one step at a time because we know that's how life change happens. And then we want to send them on mission to do the same thing for others because the hope of the world is stepping into a relationship with the only one who can make us spiritually alive, and that's Jesus Christ. That's why the good news is such good news. Not because we are merely bad people in need of improvement, but because we are dead people in need of resurrection. That's why the good news is such good news. And you might be here and you might say, well, I, I think I need that to happen. What do I have to do? This is all, verse 8 and 9, clear that up. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, the, the way you receive this forgiveness of sins, the way you become spiritually alive, you don't try to achieve something. You don't try to get religion. All you have to do is receive what God is offering you. But in order for you to do that, you must let go of control of your own life. See, because some of you are in here, you're like, I'm calling the shots. I'm in charge. I'm the man. I will do what I want. I don't care what God says. And your hands are tightly clenched around the reins of your life. But see, as long as your hands are on control, you cannot receive what God wants to offer you. In order for you to receive it, you must open your hands. And you let go of your life. And you let Jesus take control of your life. See, what we call salvation, this position of being saved from hell, this position from being saved from hopelessness and purposelessness and sin and the effects of sin, what we call salvation, that is not something that can be achieved. It is only something that we receive by faith. But it's about so much more than simply punching a get-me-out-of-hell ticket. In fact, for years, the church has presented it like that, like, get saved, pray a prayer, pray a prayer, so you don't go to hell. Well, I don't want to go to hell either, but way too many pray an emotional prayer and don't mean it, and they're like, I got my get-out-of-hell card. Well, listen, Jesus came to do a lot more than get you out of hell. He came to give you purpose on this planet, which leads me to the last point here. When Jesus makes me different, he makes me a difference maker. When Jesus makes me different, he makes me a difference maker. Verse 10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When we step into a relationship with Christ, it, he, he forms us, He changes us, He makes us brand new, but He doesn't save us to sit in a seat and sing some songs. He, send, he saves us so that we can do the good works that He has prepared in advance for us to do. This is not on the screen, but you can write this down. God's grace inspires good works. 
Therefore, if good works are not a characteristic of your life, if all you ever did was pray a prayer at some time, and yet you live however the heck you want right now, then I just want to break it to you. You're not saved. You're not saved. You made an emotional decision. You wanted to get out of hell, but you're not saved. And that's not works-based salvation. That's simply a reflection of the fact that when a gift is given to you, you steward that gift well. You treat that gift well. For example, um, last November, as we were getting this whole th process started up, we had somebody randomly give us a $100,000 check. P pretty awesome stuff. Now, you know what I did with that check? I treated it very well. I put it in an envelope. I even went to the bank to make sure that it got deposited. I didn't throw it up in the air and jump up and down on it and just kind of carelessly treat it. Why? Because it was a gift and a gift should be treated well. The gift of God's grace, when we understand the precious gift that it is, we treat it well. Because God's grace inspires good works. God's grace inspires us to step into the call that he has on our life. God's grace inspires us and changes us so that we can make the difference in this world that God has called us to do. But it won't happen by trying, be trying harder, and it won't happen by trying to make yourself better. It will only happen when you receive the gift of God's grace that he's offered to you in your life. Can we all bow our heads and close our eyes and let's pray. Father, thank you for this moment. Holy Spirit, I pray you would move in hearts, Lord. I pray that those that are in here who do not have a relationship with you, Lord, I pray you'd open their eyes to the reality of sin. Lord, even for those that are here who they have been in church all their life and have assumed they're saved because they've prayed a prayer, but they have been running from you. They have been not been honoring you with your lives, with their lives, God. I pray you'd open their eyes to their need for salvation. With heads bowed and eyes closed, but hearts open, I know there are some of you in here that well, the thing that needs to happen for you, you need to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to receive the gift that he's offering you. But some of you would say, you know what, Dylan? I've done way too many bad things. I've run from God for way too long. God would want nothing to do with me because I'm way too screwed up. I'm way too jacked up. Well, I would say that the guy who wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul, he would disagree with you because... Paul doesn't step onto the pages of history as Paul, the missionary. He steps onto the pages of history as Saul, the murderer, who didn't love Jesus, who didn't love the church, who wanted nothing more than to stomp out Christianity and destroy Christianity and destroy the church. In fact, when he met Jesus, he was on his way to destroy Christians. And yet, Jesus met him on the way. Jesus changed his heart. Jesus brought him from death to life. And because of what Jesus did in Paul's life, we have around half of what we call the New Testament. We have a huge portion of what we call the Bible because Jesus did something in this guy, Paul's heart. And I believe Paul would tell you that it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what your background is. All you simply have to do is receive what Jesus wants to give you, forgiveness of sins. He'll make you brand new. It doesn't mean you'll become perfect. It doesn't mean you'll never sin again. It doesn't mean you'll mess up. But over time, He will change you. He will make you more and more like Him. And He will work in and through you to make a difference in this world. So if that's you today and you need to give your life to Christ, all you, you don't have to try to achieve anything. All you have to do is receive it. And you do that by doing by three things, three responses. You admit that you're a sinner, that you've done wrong against God, you believe Jesus died on the cross for you to pay the penalty for your sin and that he rose from the grave. And then you give him complete control of your life. And so if that's what you need to do, if you're like, I need that to happen in my life, I want to invite you to pray this prayer from your heart to God. The prayer does not save you. Jesus saves you. The prayer is us simply responding outwardly to what the Holy Spirit is already doing in your heart inwardly. Pray this from your heart to God if this is you. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong against you. I believe you rose from the grave. And I give you complete control of my life. Take my life. Use it for your glory. My life is not my own. It belongs to you. And from this moment, Jesus, I'm all yours. And I'm all in.